وأن الله ربي وربكم فاعبدوه هذا صراط مستقيم وإن الله ربي وربكم فاعبدوه هذا صراط مستقيم The author says الاجتهاد والتقليد اجتهاد which is judgment deduction or extraction and imitation or mimicking that is mimicking a qualified scholar that's what's intended here by taqli ijtihad is extraction of judgments for which there is no explicit text that can only have one meaning extraction of judgments not beliefs yani extraction of rules not convictions for which there is no explicit text that can only have one meaning. Yani, had there been an explicit text from the Qur'an that can only have one meaning, then there is no room for a scholar to make an ijtihad. Or had there been an explicit, authentic hadith of the Prophet wasallam, then there is no reason for the scholar to extract a judgment or deduce or conclude a judgment. Because the judgment is there. And if there were a consensus, then there's no need for the scholar to deduce a judgment. So what that means is, ijtihad is done in the absence of definitive evidence. Ijtihad is done in the absence of definitive evidence. Not in the presence of definitive evidence. So, for example, that's why when you make a determination for the Qibla, because you can't see the Kaaba, that's called Ijtihad. That's truly Ijtihad. And in that case, you'd be a Mujtahid. Why would you make Ijtihad here? Because you lack definitive evidence. What's your definitive evidence? Your definitive evidence would be seeing the Kaaba with your own eyes, and then you'll face it. But when you lack the definitive evidence, then you need to resort to something by which you can conclude your answer. And then you come to what ijtihad does not bring you to definitively correct judgment in itself. Yani, you could hit the correct answer by ijtihad, but just by virtue of the ijtihad alone, you don't know that's the correct answer. Rather, you're confident that it's the correct answer. When you make ijtihad, you're confident that you reached the correct answer. And ijtihad, by the way, it means in the language, exertion of effort or putting forth great effort. So when you make ijtihad for something, then it's not going to be ijtihad if you didn't put your best effort forward. Like someone who faces Northeast and then he doesn't want to look at any more proofs. He's satisfied uh, in North America, I mean. He didn't put forth his best effort. So ijtihad is extraction of judgments for which there is no explicit text that can only have one meaning. So we're talking here about ijtihad for religious rules. I'll give you another example, though, just to give you a big picture of what ijtihad means. So, for example, you have two containers of a little bit of water. Each one of them is a little bit of water. Then a dog goes in there and he licks from some of that. He laps from some of that, from one of them. And then he comes out and his mouth is dripping. And you don't know which one he was in. But you know now that at least one of those containers is contaminated with dog filth. You don't know which one because you didn't witness it. So you don't have definitive evidence. So what are you going to do? You're going to make an itchy hat. You're going to use something. It's going to be for you a clue, a proof. And then you're going to say, this one, where all the water is around the edge there, that's the one. Although it could be that the dog hit that one, he knocked the water out, he didn't drink from that one, possibly. You don't have definitive evidence here. And maybe the other one, he drank from it and nothing dripped from there. So you don't have a definitive evidence. So that's ijtihad. The mujtahid, we're talking now about religious judgments, the halal and the haram. We're not talking about facing the qibla. We're not talking about determining if your bottle of water is contaminated. We're talking about halal and haram, religious judgments. 
and what's obligatory and what's not obligatory. The mujtahid is the one who was qualified to do that by having memorized the verses related to judgments. Means it's not a condition that he memorized the entire Quran to be a mujtahid. But he needs to have memorized all the verses related to judgments. It was said there are 500 of them. And the hadiths related to judgments. And it was said there are 500 of them. And the knowledge of their chains of narration and the situations of the narrators of the chain so that he could be sure that he's deducing the judgment from sound evidence. And he needs to know the abrogating and the abrogated. Yani, he needs to know abrogation and its cases, its proofs. Yani, he needs to know the ayahs of the Quran that came abrogating other ayahs. Or he needs to know the ayahs that are abrogated by some other ayahs that came. And whatever hadiths are involved in abrogation also. And he needs to know the general and the specific. The general is like saying, Every innovation is misguidance. That's a general statement there. And specific is like saying that من ثن في الإسلام سنة حسنة فله أجرها. Whoever paves a good path in Islam shall have its reward. So then you're going to put those two together to know that when he said the general statement, every innovation is misguidance. That really, that generality is specified. That generality is limited. It's not as general as the words suggest. He knows that because he's a mujtahid. He knows how to put proofs together. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that the mujtahid does is he knows how to put the proofs together. When someone's not a mujtahid, he wouldn't know that. When someone's not a mujtahid, what's he going to do? Like when he's a big time amateur, then he's going to just read in some hadiths or read in the Quran. And maybe he doesn't even know Arabic. So he's reading in translations. And he has no idea about these general, specific, absolute, abrogated, abrogating. He has no idea about any of that stuff. And then he'll see something and then he'll say, this is the rule. He doesn't even have enough proofs to put them together, let alone knowing how to put them together. And the mujtahid knows the absolute and the restricted. Absolute means uh, like to say freeing a slave. Freeing a slave, well, is that a believing slave or is that a kafir slave? Any slave or, yeah, I mean, there's nothing in the statement that qualifies the statement. Freeing a slave. But another ayah would say, to free a believing slave. To free a believing slave. So it's restricted or qualified. The statement has a qualifier in it. So how do you put those together? Are they two different cases or do they have the same rule? That's the job of the mujtahid. The mujtahid would say, for example, here where it mentions the slave without any qualification, the correct rule is to free a believing slave because in another spot it's mentioned with a qualification of being a believing slave. Restricted here means qualified. Qualified here means not left open. That's the meaning of qualified here. Not left open. Absolute here means left open. Likewise, the mujtahid will have mastered the Arabic language in a way that he memorized what the expression of those texts refer to. Meaning, he knows what those texts are in reference to according to the language in which the Quran was revealed. That means... He will understand Arabic like an ancient Arab, the mujtahid. He understands Arabic like an ancient Arab, not merely like a modern Arab. And of course, he doesn't have to be an Arab to do that. Allah Ta'ala bestows the knowledge upon whom he wills. Imam Malik said, it was reported that he said that the knowledge, it's not being able to relate this and relate that narrate this and narrate that so you have knowledge. He said the knowledge is a light in the heart. 
May Allah Ta'ala grant us the light. Ameen. And the Mujtahid would also know what the Mujtahids have agreed upon. The other Mujtahids. Yani, those before him. He would know what the Mujtahids have agreed upon. Because if he does not know that, we would not feel safe that he will not breach the consensus. And we would not be safe from him breaching the consensus. Like Al-Albani, who's not a mujtahid at all, and he breaches the consensus in his ignorance. If you track some of his cases that he spoke about, he will have not known that there was a consensus about what he's talking about. So the mujtahid, since he reached the highest level and he's able to deduce the judgments to extract the rules then he doesn't follow another mujtahid he makes his own ijtihad that's a universal concept in ijtihad if i go back to the examples i gave you at the beginning of the lesson this is why according to ashafiri if you make ijtihad for qibla and you come up to one direction and the other person comes to a different di direction, even if they're very close, but they're not the same, then you can't follow each other because a mujtahid does not follow a, mu a mujtahid. Another mujtahid follows his own determination. According to Ashafi'i, if you're making ijtihad for the Qibla, you follow your own determination. So if somebody comes with a different answer than you, you don't follow them. That's not disunion. That's proper implementation of the rules. So like that, a Shafi'i, he's not going to follow Abu Hanifa or Malik. He's not going to follow Abu Hanifa or a Shafi'i is not going to follow Malik, not as a mujtahid. So then the mujtahid, he doesn't need to take from anything but the Quran and the Sunnah. Is that what we're saying? No. He still needs to, in a way, take from the other mujtahids. The Ness Mujtahids, meaning he has to be in compliance with the prior consensus. That's that's how much he has to agree with the Mujtahids. But when a Mujtahid disagrees with him, he doesn't have to. He doesn't. He's not even supposed to. Not that he doesn't have to. He's not supposed to. It's not valid to follow him. So the Mujtahid, he must be in line with the consensus, though. The consensus of those who were before him. Above that, is a great condition in ijtihad, and that is nafs, genius. Being a genius, i.e. great strength of understanding and realization, so that by his genius he can uh, pull apart the very delicate and fine matters, and he can notice what Others don't notice, and so that he could unravel the obscure matters. It was said about a Shafi'i that he could debate with you and defeat you, and then he could take your argument that you just lost with and give you his argument by which he just won and debate with you again and then defeat you again. That's how smart he was. It was said about some of them that they could talk you into believing that a beam of wood was gold. Trustworthiness is conditional also, but not to be a mujtahid. Trustworthiness itself is not a condition to be a mujtahid. Trustworthiness is a condition for taking from the mujtahid. Otherwise, it's possible that a major sinner could attain the status of ijtihad. Then he'd be a mujtahid. So if a major sinner were a mujtahid, then you're not going to take his ijtihad. But he's going to make his own ijtihad as per the rules we just said. He's not going to follow another mujtahid. And it was said that Iblis himself, Satan, that he has the knowledge of a mujtahid. He's an apostate. So trustworthiness is conditional, which is being clear of major sins and being clear of persisting in doing small sins in a way that they overcome one's good deeds in number. Trustworthiness, being clear of major sins. If you're a major sinner, you're not trustworthy. And being clear of persisting in small sins in a way that they overcome 
his good deeds in number. They outnumber his good deeds. And we could have translated this in a way that they outnumber his good deeds. But it was worded this way just to try to match what the Sheikh said. Min haythul adad. In a way that they overcome his good deeds in number. Meaning, at any point where, even if you don't have a major sin, any major sins, but your small sins are more numerous than your good deeds, then that's a major sin right there. That in itself will make you a major sinner. And then you won't be trustworthy. As for the imitator or the mimic, he is the one who has not reached this level. If he hasn't reached this level, that means even if he still has a high level, he could have a high, very high level in the knowledge. He's still not a mujtahid. Take Imam an nawawi an nawawi very high level. Yani, one would see him as a big scholar. He's a big scholar, Yani. But compared to some other scholars, he's a small scholar. Compared to a mujtahid, he's not a big scholar. The evidence that the Muslims are of these two levels, yani, is there any proof from the Quran or the Sunnah that there's such a thing in our religion or is this something the scholars concluded? In fact, there's evidence that the Muslims are of these two levels. It is that the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam said, نَضَّرَ اللَّهُ مْرَأً سَمِعَ مَقَالَتِي فَوَعَاهَا فَأَدَّاهَا كَمَا سَمِعَهَا فَرُبَّ مُبَلِّغٍ لَا فِقُهَ عِنْدَهَ فَرُبَّ مُبَلِّغٍ لَا فِقُهَ عِنْدَهَ May Allah enlighten the face or beautify the face of the person who heard my saying, memorized it, memorized it. He memorized it. فَوَعَاهَا أَيْ حَفِظَهَا he memorized it, فَأَدَّاهَا كَمَا سَمِعَهَا And then he conveyed it as he heard it. For how many conveyors there are who have no fiqh? There are so many conveyors of hadiths who don't have fiqh, means they're not mujtahids. That's narrated by At-Tirmidhi and Ibn Hibban. The evidence in the hadith is that the Prophet والسلام, said, How many conveyors there are who have no fiqh? That means they're not mujtahids. They have hadiths, but they can't deduce the judgments from those hadiths. So that's what Wahhabis miss. They think just because, for example, Imam Muslim has his hadiths, the khalas he just has all the rules. It's not the case. Imam Muslim, he was not an absolute mujtahid. He was a shafi'i. It's said that most of the hadith scholars were shafi'is. So all of those carriers of hadiths, as if they're carrying those hadiths to a shafi'i, so that he can deduce the judgment, although they brought the hadiths to him. And in a narration, وَرُبَّ مُبَلَّغٍ أَوْعَى مِنْ ثَامِعٍ how many a person received the conveyance and they understood better than the one who heard? They received the conveyance. They didn't hear the hadith personally. They didn't hear the hadith firsthand. Rather, they received that secondhand or beyond secondhand. But they understood that hadith better than who heard it firsthand and then conveyed it. Indeed, this makes us understand that among those who heard the hadith from the messenger, meaning his companions themselves, among them are those whose share is only to narrate what he heard to someone else. Even though he's a companion of the Prophet, his share is to convey, not to deduce rules. And his understanding would be less than the understanding of the one to whom he conveys, which would be a tabi'i. The hadith is telling us, that there would be Sahaba who heard the Hadith firsthand, and then that Sahabi would convey the Hadith to a Tabi'i who knows the, the Hadith better than him, meaning he understands it better than him. He would be a Mujtahid, that Tabi'i, who can deduce the judgment, while that Sahabi would not be. 
that's a surprise for many people. Some people, they didn't really know the proper way to believe in the Sahaba. Their aqidah about the Sahaba is that the Sahaba are absolutely the best. Absolutely means no, no exception to the rule here. That they're absolutely the best, meaning every single individual amongst them, in piety and in knowledge. And some of them say every Sahabi is forgiven. Some people say every Sahabi is a mujtahid. All of those are not accurate. Some people would say all the Sahaba are pious. That's not accurate. Rather, their status is general. Their superiority in all of that is general. You could say the general statement. You can say the Sahaba are the most knowledgeable. That's valid. You can say the Sahaba are the most pious. You can say that. But you need to know that that's a general statement. It, it, it has room for exception on an individual basis. Whereas the one to whom he conveys is able, the one to whom this companion conveys, the tabi'i to whom this con companion conveys, he would be able from the strength of his genius to extract rulings and cases from that hadith. This is called istimbaq, derivation or extraction. The one who heard, yani the companion, he does not have this strong genius. He only understands the meaning that is close to the expression. Yeah, and he understands what appears there from the hadith. Whereas the mujtahid, he would be pulling things out of that hadith that didn't occur to your mind. From here, it is known that some of the companions would have less understanding than the one who heard the hadith of the messenger of Allah from them. And it came in another expression for this hadith, How many a carrier of fiqh there is, carrying it to he who has more fiqh than him. How many a carrier of fiqh, yani he has the hadith that has the fiqh, carrying it to, yani conveying it to who has more fiqh than him. Yani, to the mujtahid, who will use it to deduce rules. These two narrations are in At-Tirmidhi and Ibn Hibban. This mujtahid is the subject of the Prophet's saying, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذَا جِتَهَدَ الْحَاكِمُ فَأَصَّابَ فَلَهُ أَجِرًا وَإِذَا جِتَهَدَ فَأَخْطَعَ فَلَهُ أَجْرًا If the ruler makes ijtihad, and he's correct, then he has two rewards. And if he makes ijtihad and is mistaken, he has one reward. That's narrated by Al-Bukhari. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only specified the ruler in this hadith because he is more in need of ijtihad than others. Ruler here means the judge or the caliph, for example. Yani, like the judge or the caliph. Originally, the khulafa, they had to be mujtahids. And also the judges, originally, they had to be mujtahids. And in those old days, if someone were a mufti, that meant he was a mujtahid. He could deduce judgments. Now the knowledge got so low that a person could be a mufti if he can just teach you the madhab completely. Yeah, and he can answer the questions. In the past, there have been mujtahids from the Salaf who, along with being mujtahids, were also rulers, like the six caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar ibn al-Khattab, Uthman, Ali, al-Hasan ibn Ali, and Shuraih, the judge. But other mujtahids weren't rulers like the four imams, Abu Hanifa, Shafi'i, Ahmad, and Malik. They were not rulers. The scholars of hadith who authored works of hadith terminology counted the muftis among the companions as less than 10. Like I just told you, that means the mujtahids. Mufti means the one who gives ifta. Ifta means give verdict. Those who give verdict. So the verdict here is the ijtihad. It was also said that they were about six. Some said 10 sahaba. Some said six of them were mujtahids only, 
And some scholars said about 200 of them reached the level of Ijtihad. And this saying is most accurate, which that's still a small percentage of the Sahaba, though. That's a small percentage of the Sahaba and still gives you an indication of how much knowledge the Sahaba had. That amongst the Sahaba, 200 mujtahids? Wow. But over 100,000 Sahaba? Then... So it's amazing either way you look at it and is a testimony to the knowledge of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because who's their shaykh, yani who's their imam, who's their teacher? The mujtahid. Who's the teacher of the mujtahids? Who's the one the mujtahids would ask? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So if the issue is like this in reference to the companions, then how would it be valid for every Muslim who is able to read the Qur'an, because he knows Arabic, he knows how to read, and he's able to read in some of the books, how would it be valid for them to say, they were men and we are men. We do not have to follow them. It is confirmed that most of the Salaf were not mujtahids. Yani, so when those people say that, it shows their arrogance and shows their very much missing the big picture. It is confirmed that most of the Salaf were not mujtahids. Rather, they were imitators of the mujtahids amongst, amongst them. It was mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari that a man was an employee of another man and he fornicated with his employer's wife. So his father asked about the case. And it was said to him, it is obligatory on your son to pay 100 sheep or goats and to pay or free a slave woman. So that's a fatwa that he got. Then he asked the people of knowledge. They said, what is obligatory on your son is 100 lashes and exile for one year to be banished. So he got two answers, two different answers. So the father came to the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with the husband of the woman and said, O messenger of Allah, this son of mine was an employee of this person. And then he fornicated with his wife. People said to me, your son is to be stoned. So that's a third answer. So I gave 100 ghanam, that's sheep or goats, and a slave woman on my son's behalf. Then I asked the people of knowledge, and they said, the only thing that is on your son is 100 lashes and exile for a year. The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, By God, I will surely judge between you by the Book of Allah, yani in accordance with the Book of Allah, as for the slave woman and the sheep or goats, they should be returned. And on your son is 100 lashes in a year's exile. So this man, despite that he was a companion, asked some people who are also among the companions and they made a mistake. Then he asked scholars among them. Then the messenger of Allah gave him the religious judgment, which is what complied with what those scholars said. So if the messenger made us understand that some of those who heard the hadith from him have no fiqh, that they do not have the ability to extract judgments from his hadith, and their only share is to narrate from him what they heard, Despite that they understand the eloquent classical Arabic language, if that's the case of those, what about those rabble rousers, those troublemakers, those people who dare to say, those are men and we are men? They mean the mujtahids by they are men, like the four imams. In the same meaning is what was narrated by Abu Dawood about the story of the man who had his head split, his skull was split. Then he had a wet dream on a cold night. He then sought the religious judgment from the people with him. They said to him, take a ghusl. 
So he took a ghusl and died. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was informed about this. And he said, Qataluhu qatalahumullah. They killed him. May Allah kill them. Ala sa'alu id lam ya'lamu. Why did they not ask if they did not know? فَإِنَّمَا شِفَاءُ الْعِيِّ سؤال. The cure for ignorance is merely the question. Yani, is asking. So I remind myself and I remind you, don't be among the people who think they know something. Rather, know something as it is in reality. And know what you do not know. Don't think that you know something. Don't assume especially when it comes to religious judgments, but really goes beyond the religious judgments because if you have a habit of assuming, then it's going to extend into other things. If you have a habit of refraining from speaking in ignorance, then yani, if you do that even in your worldly matters, then that's going to be easy for you in your religion. You're going to say, I don't know. And really, a lot of non-Muslim people, they don't even accept, I don't know, for an answer. Sometimes they'll ask you something. If you don't know, if you were to say, I don't know, they'd say, well, why don't you guess? I don't do that. I won't even let them. I'll tell them, I don't know. I don't know the answer, and I don't guess. So I just don't know the answer. So what do you want? This means the cure for ignorance is asking the people of knowledge. The Prophet also said, alayhi salatu was salam, it would have been enough for him to make tayammum and squeeze a rag over his wound, then wipe over it and wash the rest of his body. This hadith was narrated by Abu Dawood and others. So, had ijtihad been valid from the Muslims without restriction, yani had it been for any Muslim to do it, the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would not have dispraised those who gave that man the religious judgment without being among the people of fatwa. Yani, that could have just been their fatwa. Furthermore, the function of the mujtahid that is specific to him is qiyas, legal comparison. For him to consider what has no narrated text to be like what does have a narrated text because of a resemblance between them, some similarity between them. That's the job of a mujtahid. Those words I just said, are very much easier said than done. That ability to make such comparisons really requires a very sharp and refined intellect. So we're talking about here, if you want an English word uh, that fits in this discussion right here, a, a legal term is precedent. Precedent. So qiyas is what this mujtahid does. When a case has no precedent, he will then give it the judgment of a case that already has precedent because of a resemblance between them. He asked, that's a type of ijtihad. It's a specific type of ijtihad, which is a comparison. Not every ijtihad is a comparison. So be warned and be warned again from those who encourage their followers to make ijtihad despite that they and their followers are far from this rank. These people cause destruction. And they call their followers to cause ruin in the matters of the religion. Similar to them are some people who got used to distributing the tafsir of a verse or a hadith in their sessions, despite that they did not previously have reliable transmission from the mouths of the scholars. Yani, what do they do? They'll run a circle somewhere in a masjid in on a college campus or somewhere some get together the one who's running it he hasn't taken the book and the people who are participating they haven't taken the book and even the one who's running it not only he didn't take the book he wouldn't even really have a very great education in religion and then he reads and explains, and he tells them to explain. He lets them read. They take turns reading in circles, explaining. And he lets whoever wants to say something, say something, and etc. And it turns into, turns into a very big problem. 
So these claimers, those claimers, they deviated from the scholars of Usul because the scholars of Usul said that Qiyas is the function of the Mujtahid. Those claimers also opposed the scholars of Hadith. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Allah knows best. We'll stop there for today.